Okay. All right, folks, we thought we'd end off today with a panel discussion uh, regarding the current issues in the peace process and what the future is likely to bring. And to initiate this discussion, we've asked Connor Murphy, right, uh, the brother of Desmond Murphy, uh, to join us again via video. As I say, Connor is a member of the British Parliament, a uh, member of the Sinn Féin Party, and a member of the power-sharing executive uh, there in Northern Ireland at Stormont. And so he'll get us started here with a couple of themes in the current state of the peace process. So I'll turn it over to Connor. Okay, well, firstly, I'd like to say hello to all our American friends, uh, all the students at Grand Rapids College and the other people who are studying uh, this course in relation to Irish history and peacemaking in Ireland. I'd particularly like to say hi to our old friend, Roger Schlauser. Uh, sorry to hear that he's retiring, but hopefully he'll be a still a frequent visitor to Ireland and we've known him over many, many years. And my name's Conor Murphy. Uh, I'm the MP for Neary and Armagh, a member of Sinn Féin. Uh, I'm also an MLA for the area and a minister in the power sharing executive. Uh, I have been an MLA since 1998, since the time of the Good Friday Agreement, and I've been involved with Sinn Féin uh, primarily in the period since uh, as part of their negotiating team, uh, and since the institutions have got up and working again in 2007, I've been working as a minister in the executive. Uh, the Good Friday Agreement in many ways was, was a grand compromise, uh, if you like building a, a platform or a vehicle to take us out of armed conflict onto a way where people could begin to work together uh, in a political project, uh, which from Sinn Féin's perspective would allow us to build in a peaceful and democratic way towards reunification in Ireland and an end to British government presence in our country. Uh, now there were many difficulties in it because it, as in any compromise agreement, uh, different people would interpret it in different ways and different people had different emphasis on what they wanted to see coming out of the Good Friday Agreement. And so in many ways, from the day the Good Friday Agreement was signed by all of the parties in 1998, it really became an ongoing negotiation uh, among the parties with a number of issues that were very divisive and difficult to deal with. Uh, many of them relating to the conflict and the experience of people in the conflict. Issues such as the policing uh, that we had experienced. Nationalists had a very poor experience of policing here, uh, where the police were ra effectively the ar armed wing of the state. Uh, issues around demilitarisation, because we still suffered from a very heavy British army presence, particularly in Republican areas, uh, long after the IRA ceasefire had been declared. Uh, and other issues such as the issue of weapons and the ongoing existence of armed groups, uh, which continue to cause difficulties uh, to the current day. But these are some of the very contentious issues, uh, which, if you like, bedeviled the whole political uh, process from 1998 and, and caused the institutions which were agreed in 1998 to be formed and collapse uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, and right through until we got into a, a, another series of, of fairly uh, intense negotiations which led up to the St Andrews Agreement uh, in 2007, uh, we really were not able to get the institutions functioning on any continual basis. Uh, over the period of that time from 1998, Sinn Féin became the largest nationalist party in the North and the Democratic Unionist Party became the largest unionist party. And in many ways, many people predicted it would be much harder to get an agreement between ourselves and the Democratic Unionist Party led by Ian Paisley. But we managed to do that at St Andrews, uh, involving both the British and the Irish governments and addressing a range of issues which were outstanding and hadn't been resolved uh, in the Good Friday Agreement. And from that time in 2007, we've had the institutions working uh, without interruption with many difficulties, and there have been many difficulties since, because the power sharing executive in the North is made up of a four-party coalition. It's an enforced coalition, it's not a voluntary one, uh, and it's made up of people who are diametrically opposed politically, uh, primarily ourselves and the Democratic Unionist Party. We want to see United Ireland, they're very much linked uh, to the retention of the Union, and we have quite a lot of social uh, differences and uh, political differences between us across a range of issues. But the executive and the institutions, uh, including the All-Ireland institutions, the East-West institutions as well, have functioned largely with some, some difficulties and some interruptions uh, over the last two years. Uh, we have had many uh, differences, uh, one which is one of the key issues which I think we're on our way to resolve them, uh, is the transfer of powers in relation to policing and justice. Uh, now, policing and justice has always been a very contentious issue since the inception of this state. Uh, it has caused a huge divide because the nationalist population were very largely alienated from the policing and justice system here and, and felt that it was uh, the armed wing, if you like, of unionism. 
And part of the agreement from Good Friday and, and in, during negotiations since that was to try and get an acceptable and accountable uh, policing service which reflected the whole people here, not the sort of police force uh, which we were used to in the past. And one of the key elements of that was to hand, if you like, control over that policing service to elected representatives here because the powers over policing and justice continue to be exercised from Westminster, from London. Uh, now, we have reached an agreement as to how that will happen and, and we expect uh, that to happen over the course of this springtime uh, with some uh, movement uh, in towards transferring those powers into the Assembly before the summertime. Uh, and we are very keen to see that happen and to make sure that we not only get the legislation right to affect that, but we also get the resources from the British government so that we can properly manage uh, a, a policing and a criminal justice system. Uh, policing has changed, has been transformed. Uh, communities that we represent are now working with police, still experiencing many difficulties in that because it will take some time to get those relationships correct, but it certainly has moved in the right direction and we want to see that continue. Another issue which we have serious difficulties with the, the DUP in particular and, and unionist parties generally is the whole issue of education reform and that has been one issue which we haven't managed to resolve yet and has created a degree of difficulty. We have a very unequal education system here uh, and Sinn Féin have the Minister for Education, we have that department and we want to transform the education system here and try and bring a degree of equality uh, to all children in our education system and that's something that the unionist parties have resisted. But it's another issue which we are intent on, on resolving uh, with the unionist parties and trying to get some agreement on the way forward. And so the, the institutions, as I say, have uh, largely been working. Uh, in many ways, we've been tested with a great deal of things, issues like transfer, police and justice powers, education reform. But I suppose the most difficult issue that we've faced is that tested uh, the institutions and our ability to continue and keep the institutions working uh, was the recent violence here in which saw uh, two British soldiers and a, a police officer killed. Uh, and many people would have predicted that they, that would have created such a difficulty for the political process that it couldn't survive that. So I think the response to that in many ways has given uh, ordinary people a degree of confidence that there is now uh, an ability to, to see through any difficulties which might, might arise in the, pre in the peace process, to keep the peace process on track, uh, to give some hope uh, for the future to people because people do not want to return to violence. Uh, they don't. S people who are Republicans, uh, who support us and many other Republicans as well, see that there is now an opportunity to create uh, a peaceful, democratic process of change which will bring us towards United Ireland, that the institutions that we're currently part of uh, will assist in doing that and that uh, we will continue to build political strength and, and drive forward towards that objective. Uh, and they see people taking uh, armed action is really just an attempt to upset the peace process, to, to, to reject and, and destroy the sort of change that we've brought about and really to lead us nowhere. And our response to that I think had to be very forthright uh, in our denunciation of that because I think we were obliged to give a very strong lead uh, to our own communities in relation to where we stood uh, in relation to that, that we have a strategy now, we are a very changed set of political circumstances that we saw the, the emergence of the IRA in the late 60s and early 70s. We have a strategy, we have popular support for that, we have institutions which we can work to bring us towards that goal and I think we have a moral obligation to pursue that strategy for peaceful and democratic change uh, in Ireland and that's why I think we were determined to give a very strong lead to our own community in relation to where we stood on that. So I think that our objective into the future will be to try and uh, build, continue to build political strength for the Republican project right across this island. Uh, we are an all-Ireland party. We will stand for elections in North and South and we will continue to grow uh, in political strength. There are more Republicans now in Ireland than there have been at any stage in the last number of decades. And to use our own political strength to, to uh, convince others uh, of the necessity, not just of uh, economic union on this island, but of a political union on this island. And I think as, as we go through these uncertain economic times, these issues are becoming much clearer, I think, even in the minds of unions, that on a small island of five to six million people, uh, that the way forward for us is through self-determination of all the Irish people, including the unionist people, rather than as being a, an afterthought uh, of, a, of a British government which is primarily concerned with its own affairs in Britain. Uh, and we, we will continue to work to try and convince unionists that the best way forward for them is in partnership with us and with the rest of the people in, in, on the island 
in deciding our own future. We are confident that our strategy will bring us there. Uh, we wish to engage with others, particularly those uh, across the world, uh, Irish Americans and Irish people in Britain, and there are Irish people wherever you go in the world, uh, but those who have an interest in seeing peaceful and political change in Ireland and seeing an end to the British involvement in Ireland and an end to the, the issues which caused so many years of conflict and pain in Ireland. We want those people to work with us, to support us, to use their influence to try and help us along in that journey. And that's why we're particularly at this time reaching out to uh, the Irish people across the world and trying to get them to row in behind our project uh, for United Ireland for change and constitutional change here in this country. Uh, and so we're always heartened by the interest, not just the, of students of politics, of students of conflict resolution, but of people who have Irish connections, and, and many people who have no Irish connections at all, who want us to see peace, who want to see what was considered an intractable conflict resolved. And the example that that can give to other conflicts across the world, and people from Sinn Féin are very actively involved in areas like the Basque country, uh, the Middle East, uh, in Sri Lanka, and even in uh, the Philippines to try and assist in the development of peace processes in those countries. So we're trying to export our own positive experience in conflict resolution across the world where we can. And I think there are a great many people who are still focused on the ongoing difficulties that we have in Ireland and trying to ensure that we resolve those as well. And in just a few minutes there, he has raised a, a variety of important issues affecting Northern Ireland today. And as he says, uh, things are constantly changing. And, and uh, it may seem trite, but it's perfectly true to say that change is the only constant thing in life. With the economy, with the recent violence, um, and then the relative lack of reaction that has followed, uh, there's a lot to discuss and think about in terms of where the peace process is and where it's going. Uh, and that's why our panel has agreed to join us today. What I'll do now is turn it over to the panel and they can each say a few words about what they think the current state of the peace process is. We'll give them all a turn and then you can feel free to ask questions of an individual or the entire panel, right? What would you like to know about the current state of conflict resolution in Northern Ireland? And then uh, we'll have a few closing remarks. But we'll start uh, with my colleague and my friend, Dr. Gary Burbage. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, completely uh, mess up your agenda right away. Um, <laughs> because that's what we do. I wanted you to, uh, to see uh, something that we were presented with today. Uh, one, our for one of our former uh, students and uh, travelers, uh, Garrett McLean, has uh, presented us with a painting that he did at uh, Noth. Uh, one of the things that I teach is the archaeology class, and we visit Noth and learn a little bit about it, as well as many other places. And he's contributed this to the program. Uh, Bob will be wearing it around his neck as we go to Ireland this year. So it, uh, thank you very much, Gary. What I wanted to touch on briefly uh, is, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Okay. All right. What I wanted to touch on briefly is something that has been underneath the surface um, for the last two days and has emerged from time to time um, but has not really been um, focused on, I think. And it's one of the issues that um, I've become particularly keen on uh, addressing uh, since I'm teaching a course uh, in uh, the uh, modern Irish economy uh, this time as we travel to Ireland. So I, I, rather than uh, send, sit up here and pontificate about how much I know about th this issue, uh, I will admit uh, virtually complete ignorance, um, and uh, which will make some of my colleagues very happy that I admit it right from the start. Um, but uh, rather, I'd like to pose some questions, um, and and I don't. I'm not asking for answers, uh, although if any of you feel like you want to address any of this in your comments, that's fine but rather uh, questions to ponder uh, uh, concerning the relationship between economics and uh, peace and reconciliation. So if you'll bear with me, I'm just going to kind of go through this list of questions and, uh, and leave them out there for, uh, for possible discussion at, at a later point. Uh, the first question that occurred to me was, uh, what impact uh, have economic conditions had on the process of peace and reconciliation? Uh, to expand on that a bit, uh, has economics played as large a role as religion in all of this? Uh, it seems to me, uh, quite obviously, that uh, we, we, we just got done discussing 
issues of class uh, in relationship to the church. Uh, we talked about uh, the, the relationship between um, uh, what one uh, is raised in in terms of religion and one's economic status. Part of that imposed by the uh, behavior of the British government over 800 years that we decided uh, thereabouts. So uh, it's, to me, it's an issue that, that, that needs to be addressed. How, how, uh, how, do we, how do we understand the relationship between economics and uh, peace and reconciliation? A second question um, has to do with the, uh, the, whole, the whole idea of, of the, the, uh, the two entities. You've got uh, 26 counties and then you've got six counties and they are separate entities, yet they're on the same island. Um, we, we've, we've heard a lot about the so-called Celtic tiger. Uh, we've also heard, beginning to hear now, that the, the tiger's roar has diminished dramatically. Um, I'm curious about uh, what impact uh, the, the tiger had, not, uh, not just in the south, where it's most acknowledged, but in the north as well, and, and also the question, who benefited uh, from this, this uh, tiger? Uh, I had a chance to talk to uh, uh, a gentleman in, in a, um, uh, a, a house of refreshment uh, when we were uh, in the, in, uh, across McGlenn uh, last year, and uh, he uh, had been in the construction business, had been building houses, and uh, said that he was spending a lot more time uh, sitting and talking to people um, and having refreshment than he had uh, in for a long time. And so the, the, is, is this impact um, beginning to be felt? And we all know it is, but where is it being felt? Is it being felt uh, more in certain areas? Under, uh, are certain people uh, feeling the impact of the uh, diminishment of this uh, economic boom that uh, existed? And, and, and how much did... Uh, everyone uh, benefit from it in the first place. And once again, coming back to the, the basic theme, what impact does this disparity, if it exists, have on um, the eventual uh, unification of the island and on the uh, economic status of the, uh, the folks in all places? Um, Another question, which obviously leads from that, is: uh, Are there differences, that economic differences, that that need to be addressed, and significant differences that need to be addressed uh, before uh, reconciliation can be um, successful? I think I know the answer to that, but I, you know, I throw it out there for for consideration. And then a couple of questions, just to, to wrap it up, and I'll I'll stop talking. Uh, the, the, um, the future, uh, we've talked a lot about the past and we've talked some about the present. I'm curious about the future. Um, what does the future hold? Uh, are the economy and peace uh, intrinsically entwined? Can they, can they be pulled apart? Uh, can, we, can we see the uh, achievement of some of the goals that we've been talking about today and yesterday uh, without addressing um, these kinds of issues. And then finally, um, I'm really curious, um, and again, it, we don't, may not have time to address this in any great degree at this point, but I'm, I'm curious in what is the vision for the future? Um, we heard just now uh, from, from Connor a, a little bit about that, um, but what, what, does, uh, what does a unified, peaceful Ireland look like? And, and what role do people envision themselves having in that uh, unified, um, peaceful land? And at that point, I'll stop. Questions, true, false? <laughs> uh, Roger, the answer is 12. <laughs> <coughs> As Connor said, I, you know, I think there are some major issues still to be confronted because I think we can, uh, we can, you know, apathy can set in very quickly in, in a stage where, where it doesn't seem enough is moving forward. And I think particularly against, and Gary touched on it, you know, against the current economic backdrop, um, certainly economic progression will take a, long, a lot longer than we thought it would. Um, I have a couple of thoughts, you know. Um, um, 
I, I know um, certainly over the last 10 years, a lot of work's been done both within um, the Catholic, Nationalist, Republican community, and I, I'm going to come back to those, and the Protestant, Ulster, U Loyalist community, um, looking at uh, you know how those communities can develop, how they can develop within themselves, um, the need for employment, the need to have our young people educated and qualified. Certainly um, one of the current hot potatoes is the, uh, the education system. And I briefly want to go back to Roger's previous um, remarks. And I think, you know, there's a lot of resistance, particularly from the institutional Catholic Church, to reforms in education, because that's another fiefdom that they control. Integrated education is a threat to the institutional Catholic Church. Um, I remember seeing a slogan on a wall a long time, and actually it, there's a touch of the education debate in this, um, a long time ago, and I think it's still being used, and it said six into 26 won't go. I mean, who teaches these people maths, you know? <laughs> go, surely! <laughs> um, the uh, other thing, I, 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 I heard an interview with uh, an esteemed Nobel laureate from my neck of the woods uh, a while back. Not that one, the other one, Seamus Heaney. And Seamus Heaney talked about the Celtic, uh, well, actually what he said was that the, the strings of the harp were now being plucked by the claw of the tiger. Thing is that the tiger's claws are starting to fall out, you know, and where's the economic driver going to come from? I think uh, a lot of promises were made when the tiger was rampant and roaring, you know. I think there's going to be a great difficulty, particularly with the uh, government of the 20s, uh, the, you know, the government in Dublin, to fulfill pro promises, certainly around infrastructure um, and the current economic climate. Um, one of the other things is certainly for me, you know, the integrated education movement, which I was very, very skeptical about. The integrated education movement in its original form was set up by, and yeah, it was a judgment by me of the people who set it up, by those who could afford not to have their children educated in what were described as ghetto schools. They wanted an alternative. They wanted a place, you know, my, my image of it was that this is where the nice people went to shake hands and drink tea and eat cucumber sandwiches, you know. And maybe originally because a lot of the parents had to fund the actual opening of some of the integrated schools from their own pockets. There was a, an element of truth in that, and I believe I was very unfair to them. But I've been involved with an integrated college in Derry for quite some time, and I'm always amazed when I see the, the students, and, uh, and they come up to me and they say, do you not know who I am? I live two streets down from here. Your daughter comes to my house, or I was at your house, you know. And I live in a working class public housing estate. You know, so that image that I had of integrated education is almost being a different type of privilege. Certainly that is gone. Um, one of our major difficulties, I think, is, uh, is the polarization of our community. As a result of 40 years of conflict, of fear, of suspicion, of government policy even, because certainly in my city, in the city of Derry, I mean, I put my hand up and I admit there's nothing wrong with the, with the statistics. I do believe, no matter how much anybody would say it's not true, that up to 20,000 members of the Protestant community moved from the west bank of the city to the other side of the river. But as they did that, our city council built a 10 million pounds sports centre on the west bank of the river. And as soon as they finished it, they crossed the river and they built another sports centre right in the centre of Derry in a bomb site. They spent millions of pounds building a shopping centre and as soon as they finished it, they went across the river and they built another shopping centre. A duplicity of services of, of you know, and I actually in the process of doing that, creating 
the lack of necessity for people to cross the river because they had one on each side. They didn't have to come into the city. Or if you were in the city, you didn't have to go to the other side. So segregation, not just, you know, necessarily a choice of the people who were involved. And even if it wasn't deliberate policy management, it certainly was real that local government at some level facilitated that segregation. And I'm also conscious of the fact that a group from Arkansas last week in Derry, and that was where Rosa Parks got on the bus, you know, in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I thought about this, and I didn't just think about it, you know, in the, in the last hour. And I had good reason to think of it in the last hour because I went down to the Paul Collins studio. And I look at certainly the working class Protestant and the working class Catholic. And every now and then you think about that speech of, uh, of Dr. King's and the sons of slaves and the sons of slave owners. And at a working class level, and working class Protestant communities and working class Catholic communities, there are people who are working to overcome the years and years of enmity, the years and years of division. Try to create some type of an understanding of this small island and these small places by comparison to big places in the rest of the world. That there has to be some way that we can reach out across the fences that at this point should have gone and in some, phase, in some cases have just got a bit higher. Reach across those fences or dig under those or go around those and find ways of working as one community rather than a divided community. And I, you know, the experience of that is, and you know, I, I'm not sure how, you know, how other people view it, but I'm convinced that yes, there are a lot of people who've always been committed to peace. There are, and they have a role to play and they play a very, very positive and, and it's a hard task to do. But certainly in the last 20 years, and, certain, and more likely in the last 15 years, a lot of the work that was originally done by people who had this almost natural commitment to peace, that work's been enhanced by those who have been involved in the struggle, by those who have marched on the streets, by those who have gone to prison, by those who have lost loved ones, um, and their role's not to be ruled out either. Um, the ex-combatant, the ex-prisoner, um, play a dynamic role in the community development field, particularly in the, in the north of Ireland. Um, in a sense, I want to echo some of the things that were just said there. Um, I was thinking along similar lines. This is a very strange situation that you have in the north of Ireland, uh, because in a sense, you've had the achievement by political means of peace, um, but the second part of the equation for this conference is reconciliation. And I think what you have had is peace without reconciliation. And I think the central problem here is how do you achieve reconciliation? Now, John used the word polarization and segregation. And, and I don't have the precise figure at my fingertips, but the building of so-called peace walls in Belfast has accelerated since the uh, Good Friday Agreement. Um, there used to be more or less just one wall, really, dividing the shankle from the falls. These things are proliferating like poison mushrooms. Um, and so there, uh, it seems to me, is the problem. Um, Hannah said in his broadcast that this was a forced um, sharing, right? Um, it was like a forced marriage, obviously. Uh, since this is DUP and um, Sinn Féin. So there's a way in which it's clearly not satisfactory. But it's also clearly it's the only game in town. Um, it 
been a massive achievement in many ways um, and you know a continued commitment to it is I believe required but this was a political process and it was a process um, it was an agreement which was achieved through political horse trading political negotiation and with political skills now when people talk about peace studies and reconciliation they tend to be talking about action at community level right? um, which is not a political process in a sense obviously everything's political but in the sense in which um, I have been talking my concern is uh, how effective can these kind of community initiatives be in achieving reconciliation? And I talked this morning about the kind of natural pessimism of historians. And I've always been sort of pessimistic about activities, however well-meaning uh, they are at that level. And I wonder, and I don't know the answer to this, but um, can there be an approach to reconciliation between communities to this problem of sectarianism? Um, which is in some way uh, a macro political approach. Uh, if someone comes up with that answer, there's probably another Nobel laureate in the room. <laughs> there's been a lot of talk, and I'm going to try and keep this simple and short. Just to um, answer John's uh, 6 into 26, well, the math I learned at community grassroots level was 6 plus 26 equals 1. <laughs> and uh, so that's what we are hoping for, basically, simply, and that's the answer to that. I agree, though, uh, to get in, you know, we, we can fluff around and do all sorts of stuff and talk about this and that, but the bottom line always for me was Britain's involvement. The root cause is the Brits in, in Ireland, you know what I mean? That's the end of the day. You know, we don't need a big brother, and we don't need to be told how to live and, and, and go about our own business. We just need our own space, and that's what we're hoping for. And the unionist community, I think, learned many, especially, uh, especially people from working class areas, because I we talked about this earlier on, about this guy realizing that when he went across the Falls Road, you know, he thought it was, he was a unionist and marching on, the, on I was going to say Easter Sunday, marching on uh, the 12th of July, and they were the power, they were the people. When they would cross the, the, the divide, as they call it, they f realized that the two up, two down, and the outside shitter, as they called it, was the same in one street as it was in the other. So a lot of reality, and especially the, the unions that have left um, Ireland, Northern Ireland, and gone over to England, have realised that they are paddies. Because, you know, they're treated as paddies, they talk like paddies, and that's the way they are, even though they claim to be loyal and British. But um, I just hope, as, uh, uh, one thing I don't want to see ever again, that's for sure, and that's war. I don't want to see any more violence, any more death, or any more carrying of coffins, or any more even fighting with the church about the tricolours in the coffins. You know, that's all we want. And what it does encourage me for the future is, not necessarily because he's my brother and all that, but young leadership emerging that are educated and cool and calm and collected. They don't lose the rag. That's why I was never in politics, because I would just go across the table rather than argue around it. <laughs> um, so that's what we're hoping for, and my own kids been educated, you know, and I suppose I could have, I w probably was too lazy and running after young girls instead of get, uh, getting a proper education. But um, that's what I'm hoping for, for the future, is, is our own people have been strong enough to lead the rest. And the unions, uh, you know, joining up with the unions community and br building bridges. It's possible, I think it is. I'll hand it over to Connor here. So he's got that. <coughs> Gary started by asking a few questions, and one he asked about was what the future held and what uh, United Ireland looked like. Well, the first thing to say is it certainly won't look anything like what was envisaged 10, 20, or even 30 years ago. And the second thing is, it's for me, it's not just about a United Ireland. It's actually about building a new Ireland. Some of the things that Gary touched on around the economics of the island of Ireland and the difference between the two entities on the island are very important and absolutely key to this. But one dynamic I'd like to introduce that isn't perhaps talked about as much um, and 
and probably because I live in London I'm, and, and I'm involved in uh, British politics, I'm more aware of this, is actually the political processes that are occurring in other parts of the UK, and whether I, I like it or not, for the purposes of this, Northern Ireland, as they call it, is a part of the United Kingdom. The devolution process has taken place in Wales and Scotland. Power has moved very much away from the centre. Power is not concentrated in London anymore. The Parliament and the government in Scotland have tax varying powers and powers over policing and justice and a whole range of other issues. Hopefully those will be devolved to the Six County Administration in Belfast soon as well. The Welsh Assembly, who only narrowly achieved their uh, devolution and the Assembly and Executive being set up by the slimmest of margins in a referendum, now the being put to the popular vote again will be tax varying and more powers for them. So it's interesting, Jim talked earlier in his presentation about the plantation of Scotland entrenching the British presence in Ireland. Scotland could actually provide the key to a united Ireland and a new Ireland being created. So those are all things, again, to be aware of. But when I say that it wasn't like what we envisaged, what I mean is there's going to be no Hong Kong lowering of the flag and planes of the playing of the two anthems and it all being sorted out and worked out. Of course there's going to be a transitional phase, and I suppose Republicans view the Good Friday Agreement and the setting up of the Stormont Assembly and being in the executive as a transitional arrangement. So in the United Ireland, obviously things will need to occur before that happens. You're dealing with two different education, two different health systems. I mean, in the north of Ireland, we have the welfare state that was created in 1945 that provides education and health. That isn't the case in the 26 counties, and all of those things need to be worked out and arranged. But the point about it is we're at the stage now where those things are being talked about and being arranged. People say United Ireland is inevitable. It's not inevitable. People need to understand that it's no good wishing for United Ireland. You have to work for United Ireland. Others have talked about reconciliation, and I don't want to, to, to repeat it, but, but Jim's point was actually a very relevant one. We do have peace now, um, apart from, obviously, sporadic incidents like we saw in the last couple of months. The difficulty is that people are happy with peace. People are happy that there aren't being people killed anymore on the scale that they were. They're happy that their children can go to a disco or a bar in the evening and not worry about them getting home safely. But the point is people become apathetic in one sense with that. They're still happy to remain within their own community. They're still happy to do the things and hold the attitudes they always had. Those are the things that need to be challenged, and that's the way in which a united Ireland will be achieved. The <coughs> Republic was always seen as kind of the poor boy because its economy was largely agricultural. And then part of that so-called Celtic Tiger was the emergence of a disciplined, educated workforce that was tapped into by foreign com uh, companies. One of the biggest problems, I think, for a united Ireland is the fact that there is no center of economic power which is indigenous. Um, they don't make their own cars. They don't make their own televisions. They don't make their own refrigerators. They make good drink. But, I mean, it's, it's not like in Scandinavia, you have a Nokia. Ireland doesn't have it. So, <clears throat> unless there is an incredible revolution, we keep hearing about knowledge is power. Well, if that's the case, then Ireland would certainly be at the top. Um, the UK traditionally always spoke of its special relationships. Um, back during the early days of the common market, oh, there was always a question of whether the British would come in because they had special relationships with the Commonwealth countries. You know, they got so much sheep from... New Zealand, and they got so much, uh, you know, beef from uh, Australia and South Africa and this type of stuff. And, um, you know, it seems that um, even today, what, I think there's only two of the countries in the European Union that have retained their own currency. So the Brits, again, are trying to be something special. And, um, and one of the um, uh, points, they are... They're 
in the European community, but they're really not of it. I think that as I have talked with Republicans over the years, I think that <clears throat> there has always been some question as to did the Republic sell its soul when it went into the European Union? Oh, they got better roads. The infrastructure is clearly better. But they also had an incredible influx in foreigners, not as working in Dublin, but rather as owning property. And it has changed something. And there are serious questions now that uh, the 26 counties are asking themselves vis-a-vis -vis their membership in the European community. Um, since the occupied six counties are technically, legally, still part of the UK, and the UK obviously has been in, but not of, the European Union. I would think that one of the largest questions that's going to have to be addressed down the road is, uh, what is Ireland, whether it's 26 or 32 or 1, what is their relationship, what should their relationship be with the EU? And I think that's a serious one. It has political, economic, social, and cultural questions that people are going to have to ask. And clearly, it's easy to travel. Yeah. But there have been a number of issues that have come up, I think, that have come to the very heart and soul of not just Ireland, but several other what would be considered the small countries in the European Union. It's going to have an impact on education. Um, it's going to have an impact on the social movement of peoples back and forth. It is, it's, it's going to, it's going to, it, it is creating situations today which can lead to not simply a bettering. It can lead to complexities that we as a melting pot nation, nation for 200 years have not addressed adequately. I don't think the European community has adequately addressed a number of the issues of smaller peoples as well as countries. And I think that Ireland, from what I have gathered from many, many people across the country and the island, that they're thinking about it. And that, to me, raises an awful lot of hope because I tell my students that in 2038, there will not be a majority race in the United States. What that means is white people are going to have to learn how to lose, and we ain't good at it. What it also says is that people of color have got to start to learn how to win, and they haven't always been good winners. And we've got to start talking about that stuff and if you're not hearing about it in your political science, sociology, anthropology, and history classes, your instructors are not doing a good job. And what I find somewhat refreshing is I have heard these types of questions being asked among the Irish. I think they still are in a leadership position, even though the Celtic Tiger is possibly in full retreat intellectually, educationally, and culturally. I think they are ahead of a lot of the other countries because they're thinking about the future. And it's not just the political union. I think a lot of the people are thinking way beyond it. And that, to me, is very hopeful. Very hopeful. Well, thank you all. So, many issues raised. Um, does anyone have a question for the panel, please? Yes. You go ahead. 
Not enough money. <laughs> I mean, I mean the, the interesting thing about, about politics in the 26 counties now is the uh, unpopularity of the government there. Fianna Fáil, a party which has had a natural right to government in the same way that the Conservative Party in Britain did for long periods of the 20th century, has fallen to its lower ever, lowest ever poll rating. But the equally interesting thing is it's unclear where that hostility and opposition, all of which is over the, the, the current economic crisis and the measures that they have introduced in the Republic of Ireland, things like pension levies, an increase in income tax and a reduction in public spending. Real anger at that sort of seems to, to, to dissipate into a spread of support. There's a very fractured left in Ireland. So Sinn Féin have inevitably picked up some support in that regard after having, you know, speaking very candidly, a, a, a disastrous performance in the last uh, dull parliamentary election in the 26 counties. The Labour Party have picked up quite uh, a significant uh, increase in support because of the economic crisis. But the difficulty is, in terms of Sinn Féin being the vanguard, I suppose, of the movement towards independence, is that it needs to really concentrate and work on its structure in the south. Because Sinn Féin in the north has always been very community-based. People like my father, who were elected councillors, have been active in their community for, for, for a very long time. People like Dez, Conor Murphy, Republicans have always been very active in their community and working on at the coalface in communities. So they've had that network of support. They're respected. The work that they've done is acknowledged by the fact that they're elected. That's not the case in the 26 counties, and that's a very big challenge for Sinn Féin. Here at the college, we've had we've kind of discussed in our classes the effect of Ireland and Britain being part of the EU. What I was just kind of wondering, as being Irishman, what your opinion is is the fact that they're both admitted or admitted into the EU going to help speed along the peace process and the unification of Ireland because they're kind of joined into a bigger united Europe, and so does it kind of seem like a smaller issue now that you're uniting the whole continent? and not just one country. Does that make sense? <laughs> well, <coughs> one thing I'd point out, uh, Scotland was missed um, earlier on, and uh, what the, the Scots formula, uh, at least it used to be, maybe I'm out of date, was that uh, many people argued that Scottish independence was not economically viable, and the Scot Scottish Nationalist Party came up with a formula of Scottish independence within the European community. It was independence within Europe. I think on balance, well, I remember explaining this to someone in England, they're failing to explain this. Uh, I've, I've only ever got around to voting once in the 26 county jurisdiction. Actually, I feel like calling it the free state uh, <laughs> since I haven't heard it called the 26 county so often uh, in a public forum. I think I'm just going to start calling it the free state. Um, but I've been entitled to vote there for many years, but I only ever actually got around to voting once. Uh, and in fact, I thought about this once. I voted more, many more times before I was actually eligible to vote than I've voted since. Um, <laughs> but I voted... Yeah, I voted uh, on a referendum. Uh, this would have been, I'm not quite sure, late 80s, I think, uh, on a thing called the Single European Act, right, which gives new uh, powers to Brussels um, and b b basically increased the institutional strength of the European Union. I voted against the Single European Act because I thought that it represented certain infringements of Irish sovereignty. That being said, I hoped that it would be carried in the referendum. So I was very ambivalent about it because I think on balance the European Union has been a good thing. I think Ireland has been a, a net beneficiary. Um, and issues of identity and sovereignty, particularly identity, are going to continue European Union or not. This is partly responding to Roger here because of the processes of globalization. And I think also in terms of identity, that has been on balance a good thing uh, in Ireland.
become more cosmopolitan, more outward looking, less uh, parochial. And concepts such as the new Irish, I think, uh, is uh, are are a good thing. Um, it just reminded me on the issue of identity, which is clearly linked to the notion of the European Union. Uh, um, we've talked about sectarianism and polarization. One of the things we're talking about here are people's identities, their sense of identity. And the unionist um, sense that their identity is British, Ulster is British, and so on. And I was given great hope uh, of progress some years ago during the, um, the, what did you call that disease? The cow disease, mad yes, cow, the mad cow, 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 cow disease, cow cow right? Cow the mad cow, cow disease, cow cow yeah. Uh, during the mad cow disease, the, the, uh, the British herds were affected, and there was a lot of precautions were taken in, in, in the 26 counties, but never actually, there was no outbreak there. But because Northern Ireland was part of the United Kingdom, right, their, their cattle was designated as at risk. And so their cattle the, in the north of Ireland could not be exported, right, as British cattle. And a farmer came on the news and said, look, I'm British, but my cows are Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just, uh, I just think of it, yeah, the European Union, I mean, it, it's been a massive economic driver um, for the peace process. European Union has pumped billions of euro into the uh, into uh, peace initiatives in Ireland, and uh, as well as that, I mean, I have to acknowledge the fact that you know the International Fund for Ireland and the and the um, the American government have pa have, have have pushed millions and billions of dollars into Ireland. You know, all of which we're grateful for. But I think one of the difficulties is that, y you know, and the economic climate actually f it becomes very, very relevant now. Because in uh, 2012, I actually think we're going to see the uh, probably, if not a massive cutback in European funding and pe uh, for, the peace, for the European Peace and Reconciliation Program in Ireland. If we don't see a cutback, then we'll see it cut off. Because I honestly believe that, you know, the European Parliament will sit and look at places like Romania, look at places like Estonia, look at places like Lithuania, look at the poorer new European countries and say, you know, we need to be looking at um, funding initiatives for the new European countries. Um, one of the other things was, you know, it came as a massive shock and I know there was a, yeah, there was a, a, a certain degree of anger uh, within certain political circles to the to the result of the last European referendum, when Ireland, not Ulster, but Ireland said no. Because the new um, European policy that was put on the referendum would have actually threatened what has been accepted as Irish neutrality. Um, I have I see some difficulty around the proposition of Irish neutrality. You know, if you're sitting at Shannon Airport and you see those planes coming in, and you know that the guys that get them off them you know, are going to go get a cup of tea, get back on the plane, but the guys that are still on the plane are going to end up in Pakistan or somewhere else um, in par as part of the uh, rendition process. So the Irish neutrality thing sort of holds up at one level and doesn't hold up at the other. Um, but, you know, economics are going to be, uh, they're going to be um, something that either sustains this process or the economics will actually become the excuse for this process falling apart. The city of Derry, we've lost uh, four and a half thousand jobs since Christmas. You know, but by the same token, you know, how many jobs have been lost in Flint, Michigan? You know, how many jobs have been lost in Grand Rapids? How many jobs have been lost right around the states? You know, this is, this is the global economy, and the global economy is going to go where it's cheapest to do stuff. It's just as simple as that. And you and I and trade unions and workers will have absolutely no say in it. And I think, that again, we, you know, we talk about the economics, and there's one thing I do have to mention. The students that have been in Derry have certainly heard me mention it, that when, we, um, when the uh, Good Friday Agreement was signed, there was a massive trawl around the world to get e economic investment in to Derry, particularly to Derry. And one of the uh, 
companies that we got in internationally. Renowned company, I think they were described as, and their leaflets are absolutely amazing. You know, their website's spot on. A company called Raytheon, which is great if you own a boat, because Raytheon, are the, you know the wee bleeper thing that goes round at the top of the boat and lets you know there's a sandbank here? That's Raytheon. But that's not what's on Raytheon's scope when they came to Derry. Raytheon came to Derry. And Raytheon are the company as well as making that wee beep thing on the boat that tells you there's a sandbank there. They also make the guidance system for cruise missiles. So our peace dividend was the company that manufactured the technology to drop a cruise missile down a chimney in Gaza, in Afghanistan, in Iran, or wherever it is that they want to do it. Matthew, we're talking about European Union, we're talking about investment, we're talking about globalization. I think we have to start talking and ask the serious questions about ethnic, about ethic and moral investment in a peace process. Jobs at any price aren't worth the price. John, John, you know, that's, that's absolutely fine, and I think ethics in business are absolutely essential, but how do you deal with the fact that 40% of all employment in Northern Ireland is in the public sector? Directly, 40% of people who work in the six counties are directly employed by the public sector. That's not even jobs that depend on the public sector. I mean, in terms of the, the European Union, the no vote in on the Lisbon Treaty was for a, a variety of factors. There was no coherent or cohesive no campaign or movement for a no vote against the European Union. There was opposition on the left on issues like neutrality and economic sovereignty, the role of the European Central Bank, which now operates in some respects like your federal bank. Ireland now, if you use the US model, is akin to a state's relationship with the federal bank here in the US. The ECB set the interest rates in Ireland they determine a whole range of other economic and fiscal policy. The opposition to the no vote on the right was around things like abortion and other traditional issues in terms of family and equal access to employment and a whole host of other uh, reactionary and right-wing opposition to the treaty. So it, it is complicated, and Ireland's relationship with the European Union is is a very complicated one. The biggest impact the European Union has had in Ireland, both north and south, is, is not the peace, the, the, the money that was given to set up uh, community groups and funding for, for groups that promote, promote peace and reconciliation. And they do some fantastic work, but uh, we need to be real about it as well. A lot of those have only existed for the two or three years they've had European funding. They weren't sustainable models for business or for growth or for enterprise, and a lot of them failed. You have to deal with the reality of that. But the infrastructure and the improvements in infrastructure in Ireland has been absolutely tremendous. Days and I, where we live, is 40 miles from Belfast and 60 miles from Dublin. We're right on the border. And 15, 10, 15 years ago, it was a treacherous journey to have to make to go to Dublin, to take anything up to two and a half hours. You had to go through town centres. Now, in terms of travelling time, we're equidistant between Belfast and Dublin. Those are the things that make a really important difference to people's lives. So yeah, we do need inward investment. We do need to be aware of ethics in business, but we need to come up with some sort of an answer to 45 percent, 40 plus percent of people in employment in the north of Ireland being employed by the public sector, because again, it's not sustainable. I find the discussion of the European Union very interesting, but something else that I think that's equally important is the issue of national sovereignty. So how much sustained discussion has there been about how the government will be structured once Ireland, and I say once because it will happen, once Ireland is united? Is there, I mean, obviously there's problems with any system of government. If it's devolved, you've got continued problems with people who resent unification and if control goes to Dublin again you have problems with people who are British loyalists so has there been a lot of discussion so far about how that will be structured? Well, 
Well, I think there has been <coughs> discussions. Um, if one is a uh, diehard Republican, one understands that after the folding of the second oil, the credibility of that republic, which Patrick P Pierce proclaimed in 1916, was passed on to the IRA. It was not passed on to the 26 counties. It was passed on to the IRA. So if one is a purist, one says there is going to be a major reform in the north and there is going to be a major reform in the south. And it is not going to look the way it looks today in either of the segments that what will attempt to be what is going to be established is a non-sectarian secular socialist republic yeah but my point is how is that going to be accomplished because That's you don't want it to turn into france where you have a new system of government every what two weeks or i think you're thinking you know, of italy <laughs> i think it works with france as well but you know how are you how can it be structured so that everyone is not necessarily happy, but everyone is placated? Well, I remember 25, 30 years ago, there was the talk of a federated system, uh, you know, kind of based on what the United States has. Do you think that would work? Um, any given week. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I suspect that what you're going to have to do is get people in various in the various parties on board, and at this point, obviously, uh, you know, I don't think there's any grand plan and what have you, but again, if, uh, if one is going to, uh, you know, think in terms of down the road and this is going to happen, I think there's an inevitability to it, in, in spite of what Jim says, that uh, historically there is an inevitability to it, that um, uh, it's going to take uh, brighter minds than mine to come up with this, but I think there's no question about it, there are going to be people marginalized. And there are going to be people that are going to be left out. And there are going to be a lot of people. You talk with people in England, and they don't want them. I mean, if people are dissatisfied in the six counties, and, you know, they are like, well, well, let them go to England. If they want to be Brits, let them go to England. And you talk with them. They didn't want the people from South Africa. After apartheid in 94, a lot of those people said, well, you know, where are we going to go? And they said, well, we'll go to England. And they didn't want them there, and I don't think they want a lot of these people. So that means that somehow they're going to have to adapt. Time, uh, I think, is going to uh, calm things down. The peace process is calming things down. And you're going to get a new generation, uh, as Des says, that's going to come along. And they're um, uh, hopefully going to come up with, with new ideas to address it. But there are going to be factions all the way along that have their own agendas, that uh, remember their historical past. And again, I can only really speak, I suppose, from the, uh, uh, from the little work that I know of and have talked with Republicans, that there is an element in Republicanism that claims that, in fact, uh, if we're going to follow legitimate claims in this type of thing, that it, it came back to the Army. And technically, the Army is disbanded. So, your, 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 your point about the practical arrangements, I mean, initially, and it's a purely personal uh, view, I would say the, the current assembly at Stormont remaining in place for a period and perhaps having the same relationship with the Irish government, the government in Dublin, that it currently does with the Westminster government. Uh, over a period of time, it could be worked out as to how the structure in terms of... Uh, a devolutionary or a federal arrangement with the assembly works, and how you you eventually um, subsume or or uh, or merge or however however you work that out in terms of where it ends. Um, I think there's big challenges for people in that regard. I mean, for example, I, I I think one thing people need to start talking about is perhaps the role of the Commonwealth in a purely symbolic way and how United Ireland may possibly be a member of the Commonwealth. Other republics are. South Africa is a, is a member of the Commonwealth. I think it's, a, it's about transitional period that leads to assimilation. And, and you know, uh, to remember that Ireland was one of the leading countries that had established the whole idea of the Commonwealth, both at the Westminster in 31 and uh, even in 24 before that. And uh, it was the Irish that solved that came up with that idea of commonwealth as opposed to empire, at least for some of them. 
if there were enough white Europeans, British stock in it, like Canada and uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, yeah, yeah, but then there you had those others. And, um, uh, but I think that uh, I, I would agree with Connor that I think uh, ultimately there's going to be a transitional period. But I suspect that, um, you know, as I, as I t again tell my students here, you know, it's going to be a really traumatic when uh, in the year 2100 when um, this, this presentation will be done in Spanish. And it will. That, that is the fastest growing language in the United States. And it will, it will replace English. And that's going to be a cultural shock to a lot of people. And, um, and what's going to happen the first time that a country or a, a state really wants to secede? We fought one of the bloodiest civil wars in history to say it's like the Hotel California. You can join, but you can never leave. Well, to think that this is going to go on forever is nuts. There are going to be sections that are going to, in the future, say, we're out. That is going to be such a cultural shock. And how are we going to deal with that? You know, same type of thing. So I think the whole thing is an evolutionary process. And, and, uh, uh, and I don't know. I think that uh, it'll be very interesting to see how uh, the, 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 new the younger generations deal with it. But uh, I suspect that what Connor said was true. The, the, the orientation, when we start speaking Spanish, the orientation is not going to be horizontal. It's going to be vertical. We're going to look to South America. In the north, they're not going to look to London. They're going to come down to Dublin at least for a while. But there are going to be major transformations that will take place in 26 counties. When the uh, Northern Ireland gets independence from Great Britain, do you see any section or group of people who would want to make their own separate nation rather than join the Republic of Ireland in any way, shape, or form? That's I, I doubt it very much. You know, uh, sometimes I I look at the South African uh, time time that the, the all the changes there, and there was a whole fear that that uh, you remember the guy that ran rolled around the horse. I can't think of Tara Blanc was it? Oh, yeah, and and it was incredible because watching all that stuff because we're watching it from our own point of view. And seeing him and his armies and attacking parliaments and they were doing all sorts of daft stuff and uh, it was you know it was frightening it was frightening and it was incredible though that there was a lot of um, black soldiers were on the side of the, the state and all of that and I remember one stage where there was a group of these guys came up to a checkpoint and the black soldiers was there and uh, something happened anyway and it was the first time it happened the state soldiers turned on those guys and shot them and see after that happened I don't know like people around me here can correct me but after that happened that was the end of that guy and his gang uh, so uh, could I see no I can't because to tell you this is my own personal point of view is that if the British government decide tomorrow we're out of here they're the guys that armed the people you're talking about they're the guys that trained them they're the guys that financed them so if they decide to pull the plug pull the plug on them as well you know and it's it's not been it's been well known that they've actually turned the guns on those guys and I'm not going to name names here but there was leading loyalist sectarian killers that have been killed in very dubious situations uh, and there's a lot of fingers pointing towards the, the dirty tricks and securocrats it was an old guy once said to me the loyalists they can murder but they can't fight so I, I don't know if that's the case going to be in the future I doubt it very much though there will be people who would want to do that, you know, but I don't think there's anyone who would think that it was viable. Um, and what you probably would get was some people literally leaving the country. I mean, A.T.Q. Stewart, the historian that I mentioned this morning, a couple of years ago, in an hila unconsciously hilarious interview, said, f basically said, well, who wants to be British anymore anyway? You know, because you go over to London and it's full of Pakistanis and Rastafarians. Uh, and, you know, this is the new British and who wants to have anything to do with that? And if this gets any worse, I'm going to. Now, think about this as an American, you know, as a hyphenated American. He says, if this gets any worse, I'm going to go back to Scotland, right? Because people probably came to Scotland <laughs> in about 1640, right? But he was going to go home. Um, so I, I just don't think it's... I don't think that almost 
anyone would say it is viable. And the peace process itself, and the fact that Ian Paisley, you know, was able to sit down with uh, Gary Adams and Martin McGuinness, this was literally unimaginable. Uh, the fact that they were hard to go that distance would indicate that, you know, if they can adapt that to that degree, they can adapt again. Uh, and I think it would be quite practical um, face of that situation. On the nature of uh, of a future uh, United Ireland, I don't, I can't really see a unitary state. I think that the sort of the differences of the North <coughs> as it has evolved, um, even since before partition, will have to have some kind of institutional recognition. Uh, I think probably the country is too small for downright um, a federal arrangement or even devolution, but there'll have to be some kind of institutional recognition of Northern difference. Uh, this is mainly in response to Jim Smith, and you guys are invited to uh, say something too. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, or you questioned the effectiveness of community activities. Uh, leading the way to larger level reconciliation, but doesn't that kind of local initiative open the way or invite the way for a, a kind of a larger level reconciliation? Well, you see, that's my problem. I mean, I would like that to be the case, but I can't see the the, the linkage. Um, I mean, it's, it's just my belief that, that uh, when, you, when you have a big problem like this, Right, a problem of war, a problem of reconciliation, a problem of a deeply divided society, that the solution has to be political. Now, I'm not disparaging uh, community activities, but what I'm saying is I don't see them as ultimately as a solution to those problems, which I think need to be resolved by political means. Hi. Hi. Are we done? Or I'm confused. <laughs> are you going to keep talking? Yeah, he's okay. I, I just, I, I mean, I actually. Be a gentleman, let the lady talk. I give you the floor. <laughs> no, go ahead. You can continue answering his question. Well, I, I mean, actually, the only reason why I'm going to throw something in the pot here is because, you know, I've been actively involved in the community sector for 30 years. Um, and uh, I think they do have a, I think the community sector has a valid contribution to make. And I don't think you're not saying it's not valid, Jim. What, what you can't see, or what you're not seeing is the connection between the community sector and the big picture. Yes. Okay, got that. Right. And uh, I, I think, you know, we're asking ourselves questions at the moment. You know, when I asked a question, I actually raised a point yesterday, and we talk about peace. And the word reconciliation, you know, and I mean, the, for me, reconciliation is actually something I haven't been involved in and worked in a group who has it above its door and on its stationery for the last 30 years. Reconciliation, we take the word apart and we look at, you know, reconciliation. That means we're reconciling people. And in the honest truth of it, as you know, at a point, these are people who were never reconciled in the first place. So actually what we should be doing is starting a conciliation process rather than a reconciliation process and leave that for another 30 years down the line. Um, but the, even the community sector, I believe, certainly holds a key because the community sector are part of what informs policy, informs politics, informs people. And I think that information, that process of information, allowing people to discover their capability, their potential, their and, and, and develop that capability and potential has to be something that can't be seen as outside of a political process. So every time we get somebody asking the question about how relevant is community development in a place like the Craigan or a place like Bestbrook or wherever, you know, for me, this is about empowering people. When you empower somebody to tie their own shoes, you know, I mean, it gives a, it actually gives them a, it, it gives them a skill, and I'm using that very, you know, it's it's very 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 small example, you know, but uh, I I think you know, I mean, the sense of satisfaction if we look at community development, you know, of a of a 
three-year-old who learns to tie his own shoes has actually found that he's completed something that yesterday he wasn't able to do. And I think that's something we build on, you know. Aggie, that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about. I, I just wrote something down here also uh, that, I th that I think really relates to that. Uh, from the Philippines, there's a boxer uh, that competes in America. His name is Manny Pacquiao. And Paid 15 quid to watch him knock Ricky, Ricky Hatton down. And TV old <laughs> second <laughs> from Ricky Hatton from the UK. That's, yeah. This will sound funny, but I, I really believe in this. Uh, whenever he fights, like Ricky Hatton and Oscar De La Hoya, um, the streets of the Philippines clear out and, uh, you know, yeah. rebels in the south even uh, call ceasefires with the uh, Philippine military forces down there to, uh, to watch uh, Manny fight. Uh, and I think as... Mr. McCourt said, "If uh, you know two groups can achieve that, uh, you know that that really means something." We have a good boxer. Let's start. John Doty's a good boxer, and he's a dirty man. He's not an Armand man. <laughs> okay. Um, Connor Murphy mentioned that the. Education reform is the only issue that hasn't been solved by the Good Friday Agreement. Um, I was wondering if you think that the Catholic Church is a major reason for that. And moving on. Connor, <laughs> I, I have this here, Jeff, and I'm trying to hear what Connor's talking about there. So Connor, that's enough. The church to be an obstacle to, to reform and education. Is it what? It's the church to be an obstacle to reform. The problem with the education thing, the right. Oh, the problem. The problem. I. This is my own personal belief yet again. Uh, the problem with the, the whole education thing was with Katrina and and taking it on is. I remember when Martin McGuinness became education minister. We're talking about this at the very start. The, the unions crapped themselves. Like you know, the education. There, here's a, an, an ex IRA leader going to be over the education of their kids. And so there was, I, when Martin McGuinness first went, it was incredible too, when he first went to different places and he was education minister, there was people in the unionist tradition because of his past, didn't want to know. But the civil servants that were working with him, they couldn't believe the difference because they were used to this hierarchy and the ministers coming in, the ministers going out and Martin brought them all in and gave them all coffee. They all sat around and this is the boss. They, they just couldn't handle that kind of stuff. But it, where it is with Katrina Rowan and the whole 11 plus stuff and the, the problems with that, it was for a couple of reasons. Again, it was Republicans were in charge of education, but there was other things to it too. Th she, was a oh, she was a woman. And secondly, she spoke Irish. And they just decided, you know, they weren't going to play ball in this one. Will it ever be resolved? Yeah, it's like everything else. It will be resolved. You know, it's, it's, it's leadership that resolves all these things. And it's, you know, people, the, the the old battles get worn out and eventually people get get a bit of common sense and uh, come around the table and resolve them. Uh, I hope it's resolved and I, I do believe it will be resolved. The Catholic Church is a big part to play in it too and there's kind of split on it in, in ways but uh, as uh, John said earlier on about the control stuff, that's where their problem is. I, I It was incredible, from a totally different thing. Uh, when the, the peace process started to begin and then the, the Republican movement had the problem with... Um, the RUC and the PSNI came on board and there was still all those problems, there's still all the, the collusion and the special branches and all that kind of stuff. The Republican movement in the cities decided to have their own thing. I think it came from the United States. In fact, we're funded by people from the United States called Community Restorative Justice. I don't know if you're aware of all of that. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, it was basically local people in areas that couldn't accept the police force service into the area would get if there was a conflict of, or if something happened in petty crime or something happened, with it, they would get the people together, the people that were offended and the people that were offended uh, together and try and resolve it. Now, I they decided to, to, to put, th that was happening in Belfast and they decided to have that in South Armagh and different other places where the police didn't come into. So they asked me to be involved in it and I didn't particularly want to be involved because I was sick all my life having to do that anyway outside of CRJ. But when I d did get involved in it, and uh, I, uh, I f found it very productive, and, and people were starting to address issues, especially antisocial issues. In, in 
the gentleman either side of me would remember in our areas, antisocial uh, issues were sorted very quickly, and that was it. And there was no more of that. That's why we hadn't got the drugs because people just shot them or batted them, one of the two. And there was no jail, so that's the only chance. That was the only thing they could do. But so this was a different uh, tack. This was different direction. But they asked me to go to the local bishop, who was a good guy. I thought and believed he was a good guy. I used to go in and visit the boys in Long Cash. He's a bishop now at the moment. Again, I'm not mentioning names. This is all on TV. But the first thing he said to me after me delivering what the community started for justice was, he says, where does that leave us? And it was, I said, what do you mean? Where does it leave us? Uh, and he said, like, you know, they always operated with the REC, and it was them going to, you know, work, go to the REC and say, this is this we're, we're preferring this to you. And, you know, I was kind of surprised at that. And I just asked him, one really simple thing was, where did you go wrong? Where did the church go wrong? And that was the end of the conversation, and that I left. But Community Start of Justice is still operating in both loyalist and nationalist areas, and it is very productive. Totally different thing from the education, but it's maybe linking some way. F far be it from me to interrupt the, the latest bout of anti-Catholic church bashing, but <laughs> I, 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 ju I just think it's important to clarify the issue about education and the disagreement about education. It isn't around the segregation of schools, and schools in, in the north of Ireland operate within the maintained sector, which are Catholic schools, the state sector, which by and large are referred to as Protestant schools and attended by Protestants, and a much smaller integrated sector, and also an Irish, a, a growing and increasing Irish medium sector. The dispute within the executive is around selection at what, what you call grade school before you move on to high school. And at 11 years old, we make children sit an exam and tell them whether they're a success or a failure, depending on how well they do at that exam. They're sent to a grammar school or a secondary school, a high school, a, a, a comprehensive school, depending on how well they do at 11 years of age. And that's... Uh, well, I passed it. <laughs> I passed it, and you're a professor now, and look at me. But, but, but the thing about it is the two unionist parties in the Assembly oppose the scrapping of the 11 plus, as it's called. The two nationalist parties in the Assembly support the scrapping of the 11 plus. The Catholic Church is very divided on the issue, and I actually think the Catholic bishops haven't given an adequate or proper lead on this because it fails all children. The interesting thing is the unionist parties who support its retention need to look at the statistics in their own working class Protestant communities. It fails all children, but it particularly fails children in Protestant working class areas. 2% of children on the Shankill Road passed the 11 plus two years ago. Can I just... Well, And I'm not too sure if it's the control thing, but I know what the, the problem with them and, and uh, Katrina Rowan and with obviously with Martin McGuinness. But just to, uh, to add to Jim feeling 11 plus, my brother Declan was the only one out of a family of nine passed it, or failed it, sorry, I beg your pardon, failed 11 plus, and he got his law degree in long cash. <laughs> Higher <laughs> education. And he was the only, actually, prisoner that did get the law degree in long cash. We're running out of time, but I wanted to ask a question of my own. Several months ago, there were a series of killings, murders. And I remember when that happened, a lot of people were filled with fear and skepticism about the peace process. And they waited, a lot of people waited for a massive retaliation. And they continued to wait. And as they waited, some hope crept in. And I'm wondering what is in your minds, what's the greater lesson here, right? Should the episodes that happened a few months ago, should that give us cause for skepticism about the peace process? Or should it give us hope, right, in that uh, massive retaliation that many people feared did not come? Personally speaking, again, I'm always saying this because of the cameras and that. Personally speaking, what happened there was, um, when you consider, I'm just going to go to the military side of things, what happened there. When you consider the IRA in their heyday, at their height, hadn't got an IO intelligence officer in Balamina. They hadn't got the information. They hadn't got the operation around Balamina. And um, so who gave them that intelligence? Who gave them that intelligence to carry out that operation? And the other wee tiny thing, this is just us ourselves discussing this locally and talking about it. 
The other thing, if you go into Ballymena, Ballymena is Paisley's country. That's where all the uh, off-duty soldiers live. That's where all the off-duty police people live. That's where they're all tooled up to the nines. They've all got legally held weapons. And these guys that went in to shoot, uh, these guys that went in to shoot the, the, uh, the British Army um, fired off AK-47s. And AK-47s are the loudest weapons you'll fire off, shoot off. And in the middle of Ballymena on a Saturday evening, they bring in the heaviest guns to kill these soldiers. That's one observa observation. I'll, I'll continue with the other, the shooting of the policeman. The continuity IRA claimed to do that again. For 30 years, they left the Republican movement in 1986. 30 years later, 30 years later, the, the first thing they do is shoot somebody. They hadn't shot anybody in the 30 years. The army's off the hilltops. The army's off the streets. The police aren't got the checkpoints. Where is all this? So you ask yourself, why is this happening? That weekend, the police, uh, the devolvement of the police and justice was going through the House of Lords at the time. So I'm, I'm going back to the old... We talked about collusion for 20-odd years, and people used to say it was, it was Republican propaganda. And now they're coming out, and they're saying, oh, all right, there was collusion. And now they're coming out and, and admitting the, w the loyalists were armed up the, the by the British securocrats and by the British Army. As far as I'm concerned, the, the guys that did that are not Republicans, they're criminals. Absolute criminals. Uh, they were set up by a, a darker force that when they needed them, they would turn them on. And when they don't need them, like many of the loyalists has happened to the Billy Wrights of this world, etc., they turn them off. So the one thing that did come out of it was that what they expected to see coming out of it uh, was the, the, the falling down of the, uh, the relationship between the DUP and the Sinn Féin, and they expected that to happen, but it was the total opposite. So I'm wondering, is that the last end kick of a bad breed within the securocrats and the British government? We'll have to wait and see, but I would totally and utterly condemn what happened, because it wasn't done by Republicans. Whether they claimed to be or not claimed to be, they weren't Republicans, they were organised crime. I, I mean, I actually think uh, that when it happened, particularly the shooting of the, of the, the shooting of the two soldiers first, I think there was almost an expectation that loyalists would respond. I'm aware at a certain level, prior to that, the conversations had been going on between. Uh, various parties and included in, uh, in those conversations was a, a long-standing arrangement of a no first strike policy. And I think there maybe there was some internal wrestling around um, whether the killing of two soldiers, two working class um, guys from England who uh, weren't standing on a street in Antrim to occupy Ireland and I think the idea that, you know, within a couple of hours, they'd actually been on a plane to Afghanistan. I think, yeah, I, I have a different sort of a, a different interpretation on that. But I think, you know, if it had been interpreted by at some level that the shooting of two soldiers on the uh, in, uh, in, an in Antrim was considered to be a first strike, then loyalism probably would have felt justified in responding. But I think it was seen very, very quickly that this wasn't um, what would be considered, or what would previously have been considered a sanctioned action. It was seen for what it was. It was seen as an action of a small group that were outside of a process that from the very start they were determined to wreck. And I think the fact that yeah, cool hell. You mean, I, and I, I, I wrote about it that there were cool hands, the cool heads, and there were steady hands. And uh, you know, sad and tragic as it was, it was an awful price to pay. To turn around and say, "See, I told you the process was stronger. It shouldn't have happened. It needed to be condemned. It was condemned." Um, but I think, again, I mean, even the relief within the unionist community that loyalism didn't respond 
was almost palpable. And I think there actually was a push within the next couple of days when the policeman was shot because there was a gap between it. And I think if, if the shooting of two soldiers wasn't going to push loyalism, loyalism and an armed response, then somebody's figured it out, well, maybe now, um, if we go and shoot a policeman, that might prompt loyalism and the response. So on two separate occasions, the challenge, w well, actually, it's not a challenge. Um, the response, I believe, that was, that was expected by the people who were responsible for it. I mean, what you have to remember is these are the people who decided that their course of action was going to be to put 20,000 soldiers back on the streets of, of the north. The only way they could prove the process wasn't working was to put 20 th or, or 100,000 soldiers back on the streets of the north. My evidence that the process is working is that our cemeteries aren't getting any bigger. Thank you. We're about out of time, but I know, Connor, you wanted the mic here for a moment uh, at the end of the conference. <laughs> Yeah, according to Des. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for giving me the heads up on that one, Des. Uh, <laughs> I told you. You come over here. It was ju just basically, myself and Des are, obviously, those of you who were here yesterday know our, our family linkage and that we're from the same village. And we presented your uh, college president last night with a plaque from our council on behalf of the mayor of the council. And we just like to say here before the conference closes how grateful we are to all of you. And we were talking about this last night, and funny enough, Des and I have known each other since I was born, maybe even before I was born, Des. But, we, uh, <laughs> but we, we have actually learned a lot about each other in the last couple of days as well, which has been interesting because we don't often get the chance at home to talk about this because we're dealing with everyday life and there doesn't really seem to be an appropriate point to start to reflect and analyse and talk. But what we really wanted to do just before the conference closed was to give Roger and... Bob uh, and a, s a small token of our appreciation all the way from South Omaha. Des is going to tell you a bit about the, the two things that we're going to present. And we also have a small token for, for Stacy as well. Where is Stacy? She's out the back there somewhere, is she? So we'll give Stacy hers first. Has she gone home? Yeah. Okay, well, we have, we have a little present for Stacy as well, which we'll, gi we'll give to her. But Des, if Des, you want to talk a bit about what we're giving you. These are borons, uh, they're drums, believe it or not, but we didn't take the sticks with them because we didn't want the bit of artwork done in the front of them. They were actually done in Castle Ray, Castle Ray uh, prison in the 26th, at the Free State. <laughs> Good stuff, Jim. <laughs> uh, you know, it's incredible how the, f uh, I, I worked in, in a hotel in Uri, and there was a wee guy came down from, uh, to play, you know, on Sunday, Sunday lunchtime, there's some wee guy playing an organ and uh, everybody's eating and dining and all the rest. And this wee woman came up and said to him, where are you from? Your music's great. And he says, I'm from Drada. She says, ah, oh, Jesus, the free state. And he was highly offended. He wasn't even going to come back the next week to play. He hadn't heard that in 50 years. But it is. We always called them free staters because we live right beside them. But these, two, these guys that made these, we asked them to be made because there are no political prisoners. There were no political prisoners really that uh, left. But there were some left in the 26 counties that haven't been released yet. And they made these for Roger and for... Uh, Bob here. The reason again, as I say, was the, the mural on the front of them, but also the leather they only could get in is a very light leather, so the feet in them would actually damage them. So we're just giving them as wall hangings for their office or their home. So I'll give to Roger and you give to Bob. The last little thing I had for Stacey was a little jar of marmalade and a bowl. <laughs> but believe it or not, it's made with whiskey. So that was <laughs> the flip side. I am an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. And thank you to our expert panel. It's been fascinating.